Our God is holy, and our God is your victory. You are not the victory. Your victory is in Christ. Some of you come in here discouraged, and you're ready to give up. Some of you come in here and you're like, I ain't holy, and I affirm you, you're not holy, but we have a God who is holy, and we have a God who has died for you and loves you, and he is your victory. That is why you always have victory. Yeah. You are never defeated as a believer. You are never defeated because it's victory. Right? Your victory is in him. Praise God for that. All right. All right. So I got a friend, and his name is, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you his name because then you, some of you may know him. And, but a couple weeks ago, we were having a conversation uh, about life, and, and uh, I could tell that he was in financial struggles. Right? Like, you know when you're talking to somebody, you're like, man, they're, there's got to be something. They're struggling financially. And, uh, and so we, we kind of kept talking, and, uh, and, and I just said to him, as the general Christian thing to say, hey, if you need something, let me know, and we'll, we'll try to meet those needs. So he says to me, hey, I need your car. I need your bank account. I, I need your social security card. And we were beginning to laugh. And I was like, okay, we'll see you. God will meet your needs. And walk away. Now there was humor in that and he knew I was joking and all that kind of stuff. But I've thought about that a lot the last couple of weeks. We have a tendency to talk about kind of the big picture God. God provides. God has a plan. Um, God heals. Uh, God will meet all your needs. But the problem is, last I checked, God hasn't written me a check recently. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? God doesn't just write a check. So our tendency is to think, what good is God? Uh, you, you, you're struggling with a decision to make. It's a big decision. It's not a small decision. It's a big decision. It's, a, it's, it's like a whole life, whole family. Am I going to move or not move? Uh, you know, what, what should I do with my kids? Where should I take me? You know, all, all those, those big questions that you get going. And you're going, God, show me your will. I know you got a plan for my life. God, show me your will. God, you got a plan for me. God, you got a plan for me. Show me your will. And, and what you want is God to sit down at Caribou with you face to face and tell you what to do. Right? Am I, are you with me? Am I just the only one who goes through this? All right, so I'm not alone in this whole deal. And so then we have a tendency to just go, what good is God? I mean, if you can't have a face to face meeting with me, what's up? You know what I'm saying? If you can't write a check, what's up? We're going through a tough time in our marriage. We got these marriage issues going on. Our husband, seriously, your husband, not my husband, your husband needs to be beat up. I mean, you know, you know what I mean? Like he needs a little slap and he needs to be woken up. He needs to be like, like, like a door slammed in his face. Like stop living the way you are. Start loving me. What in the world are you doing? You know, put your faith in Jesus. Why aren't you doing all this stuff? And you're talking 10, 15, 20, 25 years, all right? And, and, and last you checked, God has not come down, right, face to face, literally, and said, wake up, man. So when times get tough, you can't meet your bills. And because God may not write you a check, you say, what good is God? Now let me be clear. God can do anything he wants. He can write you a check if he wants to. It's not a, a great check, yes. 
He's got a really big bank account. If you want a bank account, right? It's not, it's not that he can't. It's just that God, God most of the time works differently. God most of the time. Now, now I, I've, seen, I've seen things in my life personally where I've gone, God. I've got no other answers other than God. But, but generally, especially when times are tough, we're going, God, this is what I need because you're not meeting this need. I'm going, what good are you? And yet God is over here working things out differently. And because it's different, you go, what good is God? But here's the difference, people. I, I am so pumped about this message. I, I just pray God does an incredible work in you. Here's the difference. God uses you. To write the check. God uses you and your abilities and your strength to surgically operate on somebody to have them healed. Now, can God heal? Absolutely. Does God heal? Absolutely. I've been in hospital beds where people have been healed miraculously. I'm not saying that God cannot do that. He will and he can. But he also uses you. God uses you. You have been empowered with the Holy Spirit. We look for burning bushes. We say, oh, if Jesus was just here now, Jesus could tell me what to do. You know what Jesus said to you? I'm going to send one. That's going to be a great helper. He, he's going to give you power to do more than what I even could do. He has empowered you with the Holy Spirit. God uses you. Look at Ephesians 3.20. Powerful text. Powerful. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Wait, 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 what? what? Did, did you read that? Let's read it together. Now to him. Do you believe that, Christian? But don't forget the end of this verse. According to his, to his power that is at work within us. God uses you. He uses us to accomplish things that are immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. Can you imagine? That's, a, that's awesome. But he, he, here's what we do. Um... God, I, I have a lot of good excuses of why I shouldn't do that little thing. God, I, you know, I'm kind of getting old. And honestly, I'm just kind of comfortable right now. We love excuses. We are, so, uh, God, was that really you? Um, seems kind of hard. No, probably not you. It's probably just my craziness. God has given you the ability to do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine. But we have some great excuses. We have some great excuses. And let me tell you something. So did Moses. Moses had some great excuses. Moses had some great excuses to, to not live out the incredible adventure of faith that God took him on. At about the age of 80. Anybody 80 in the room? Okay, so this applies to all of you. None of you have excuses. All right. So open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. And as you do, let me pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning, and I pray that, that you will use this time, this sermon, your text, to do immeasurably more than all I could ask or imagine. 
Lord, I, I pray that you will take this and, Lord, that you will set this church on fire. That, that you will set this church on, on, on a pace with you. That, that we will live out all out for you, no matter what the cost. Lord God, you desire more. And not just from us, but for us. And Lord God, may we have the courage to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Exodus chapter 3. Let me, let me just kind of give you a quick, quick update. Some of you are familiar with Moses. Some of you have no idea who in the world Moses is, other than he has a really cool name. But at, at this point in Moses' life, Moses is a shepherd. All right? He's a shepherd. He has a, he has a wonderful wife named Zipporah. He's got some kids. He's out shepherding. Okay? He's out herding his flocks. All right? He's on his way to Mount Horeb, which is this mountain of God. And he's on his way. He's going far east. He's, he's just kind of off wandering around. All right? For 40 years he's been doing this. All right? For 40 years he's been herding flocks. Nice, comfortable life. Doing the same thing every day. How many of you like to do the same thing? Like, God, don't surprise me with anything. I just want exact, I just want to do the same thing all the time. All right, good. I'm glad some of you admit, admit to that incredible, I'm not going to say anything. All right, and, and in the midst of this, the angel of the Lord appears to Moses, all right? And, and he appears to him in a, in a bush, which is an, an amazing thing. This bush is on fire, but it's not being burned up. And, I mean, just imagine Moses. He's kind of like, oh, he sees this bush, and it's burning up. And he walks towards it. He's curious of, of, of what it is, of, what, of what's happening. And, and so he sees this thing, and the angel of the Lord begins to talk to Moses. Can you imagine this? A bush talking to Moses. Crazy. But it's true. God can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. God can do this. God can do this kind of stuff. All right. Let's look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 9. This is what God says to Moses. God is saying this to Moses out of the bush. He says, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go! I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Okay, not your everyday experience. A bush talking to you. Anybody ever seen a bush talking to you? You may want to go see a doctor, right? Okay, but let, let, me, let, me, let me say this to you. When God begins to call you, when you begin to hear God's voice, and you will hear God's voice, when you seek, you will find. It's going to be something weird. He, he's going to ask you to do something crazy. He, 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 he's going he's gonna to rock your world. Okay? He, he's going to do something you're going to go, what? Why? Huh? If you would talk to us, sane Christians, most likely we'd be like, um, I don't know if that was God. Right? It was just a bush. It, it's, it's like this. Here's some burning bushes. It's, it's, it's when, you, when you get that something and, and you're at this restaurant and you get this something in, in you and you're like, man, that, there's something about that person and they're struggling right now and, and I need to go up and talk to them and pray for them. That's crazy. Most likely that's God saying to you that person's broken. It's, it's, it's like, um, it's like when, when you get this thing from, from God and, and he says, hey, uh, and you, you like have this sense and this burden. It's like, hey, write a check for $100 and give that to that person. That seems kind of crazy. Could be a burning bush. Um, it, it could be that, that friend that, that, that you had five years ago that God all of a sudden lays on your heart and you're like, why am I thinking about this person? Why am I praying for this person? I don't think I want to call them. It's been five years. Could be a burning bush. The neighbor that's living next door to you. Um, and God's going, just walk across the street and ask him over for dinner. No, don't want to do that. That's really uncomfortable. Okay, when, when God speaks to you, it's going to lead to some uncomfortableness. It's, it's going to lead to a little bit of faith. But we have great excuses. We, we are. 
we are full of some great excuses. Here's, here's number one. Here's number one. Well, let's read Exodus 3.11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Right? Who am I? Three excuses. Number one, what Moses is saying is, I'm not good enough. I mean, who, who am I to go to Pharaoh? Now, all of us are like, Moses, you are so ridiculous. Come on, man. You grew up in the palace. You grew up with the Egyptians. Like, you grew up in Pharaoh's household. Of course you're the one. I mean, it makes so much sense. But Moses is like, it's not me. I'm not good enough. And you know what? Moses has a great case. Because let me tell you a little bit about Moses. Moses is a murderer. Do you, want, do you want a murderer leading God's people out of, out of Egypt? A murderer. Okay, not only is Moses a murderer, which I'm sure that he carried with him all those 40 years while he was being a shepherd. No, he, the guy's a coward. He's an absolute coward. I mean, think about it. Someone, there's a rumor that he killed somebody. So what does Moses do? He runs away. Like the moment that he could finally make his stand for Israel. The moment he could be the man. The moment he could make that stand firm. You know what I mean? And like rock the world. He's like 40 years old. He's like, you know what I'm saying? Like you're strong. You're ready. You're, uh. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh. And he, and he uh, oh, oh. He's running. I mean, the, the, guy's, the guy's a coward. And not only that, the guy stutters. He's got a problem with his speech. I mean, what's up with the, talking about you want a leader? Let me tell you something. In, in the world's eyes, if you want a leader, make sure that he can speak and motivate very, very well. Right? That's what everyone would say to you, right? Okay? All right. God's like, yeah, well, I know you're a murderer. Um, yeah, I know you ran away. And, yeah, I know you have a stuttering problem. But look at what God says to him. God says this, verse 12. God said, I will be with you. So we think we're not good enough. We use that excuse all the time. I can't say it the way that this person says it, so... I don't think I'm the guy. I'm I'm not the woman to be able to speak to this woman about this situation because I'm not good enough. I don't have enough talent to be able to do blah, 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 blah. I'm not good enough. We say it quite often. Chris Hodges says this. He says, So many times, we are our own biggest barriers from getting God's best. Isn't that the truth? I'm not good enough. Look at my past, God. Look at what I've done. I've been addicted to this. I cheated on my wife. I betrayed a friendship. I used to, I was, how could you use someone like me? You know what God says to you? I am with you. Don't use the excuse that you're not good enough. Number two, I need to know more. Second excuse, I need to know more. We are really good at this one. God, I'll go, but I need to know a little bit more before I go. Right? All right, here we go. Exodus 3.13. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? I mean, God, what do you want me to do? Like, show up in Egypt? It's been 40 years since I've been disconnected from my people. Show up. Say, Hey, you know, uh, the other day I was talking to a bush. And there, it was really cool, there was this bush, it was on fire, and it was speaking to me, 
and it was telling me to come and be your leader, and, and it was telling me that we should all go and leave Egypt. Yeah, the, all the, the thousands of us, yeah, we should just go. Moses is like, what in the world? What, what am I going to say? Who is sending me? What am I going to tell them? I need to know more, God. I need to know more. So God answers. Verse 13. Uh, verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Love that. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. What God is saying is, I was, I am, and I always will be. I am. I just am. You know, Jesus talked about that too. Jesus called himself the great I am. If you're wondering, did Jesus ever claim to be God? Yes, he did. Was he God? Yes, he is. Tell him. I am sent me. And then in the next couple of verses, God describes it a little bit. Tell him the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and God of Jacob has sent you. So, so God kind of covers his bases a little bit. But, but Moses, he's still not covered. Now, now you got to think about this. He's talking to a bush and he still has questions. So next time you think, oh, well, this is Moses in a bush. No, Moses was like, I know I'm talking to a bush right now, but I'm still, I still got questions. I need to know more. So Moses has another question. Chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered, Well, what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? What if? What, what, what if they don't believe me? What, what, if, what if they... they uh, what if? Uh, suppose. What about? What if? I need to know more, God. I think one of the biggest hindrances of us walking in faith as followers of Jesus is the what if question. Well, what if we run out of money? Then what? What, what if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? What if when I get into this conflict, what if no one likes me? What if they don't trust me? What if, what if, what if? And then what happens is, we stay home, comfortable, and complacent with our little old selves. Growing old. And we're missing out on the adventure that God has for you. Because you're asking, what if? What if? And you need to know more. Once again, this Chris Hodges says this. If we're going to worry about what others think, We'll simply never get more of God. Because most of our what-ifs are driven by the fear of people. Most of our what-ifs are, what if he says something about me? What if this person does this to me? What if, what if, what if? And it's a fear of man. Rather than trusting in the victory that you have in God. And it's interesting what God does. God tells Moses, he gives him three incredible miracles, but we go right to the miracles and we always think, well, if my staff stern turned into a snake, well, I'd follow God too. You know what I mean? If I took some water and put it on the ground and it turned into blood, well, I'd follow God too. That is such an excuse. Moses simply obeyed. Moses did the next right thing, and God did the miracle. We want the miracle before obedience. God wants obedience before the miracle. You just obey, and God will perform the miracles. Don't settle for miracles first. Don't wait for the miracle. You obey and watch God Perform miracle after miracle after miracle. Don't lose sight of that. Three excuses we use. I'm not good enough. Number two, I need to know more. And then number three, someone else will do it. How many times in our walk with God, we've been called into a ministry, we've been asked to do something in a church, we've been asked to do something in the community, we've been asked to do something, we've been asked to serve God in a certain way, and we look at this situation, we're like, 
um, I think someone else will do it. Right? Um, I think, yeah, someone else will. I, I, think, I, I really thank God, I really thank God that you should send someone else because I just don't know if I could do it. I mean, that's what Moses says. Look what Moses talks about. Incredible excuse. Look at verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, Oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go! I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Now remember what Moses has seen. A bush, blood, a snake, other things. But Moses said, Oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. Just send someone else. I'm not the guy. I'm not the woman. I'm not the one you want. Just send Send someone else. What I've experienced in my own life is the older I get, the more excuses I have. And I can just imagine Moses being 80 years old. 80. And you get that from Acts chapter 7, verse 11. For 40 years he was in this desert with a poor and family and building a family. I can just see Moses... I can just see Moses going, thinking in his head, God, I, I got this family and I got my wife and my kids and I'm 80, God, and it just doesn't make sense. I'm a murderer. I, I got all these things. I mean, just send someone else. It's not me. Send someone else to do it. God, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable. I kind of kind of like my wife and my kids. I mean, to take them all the way back to Egypt, it kind of seems a little bit crazy to me. To send someone else. In our small group, we were talking about stories of faith. And we asked each other, by the way, if you're not in a small group, you've got to get in a small group. Um, this church, there's a couple things that's at the heart of this church. Um, number one is we, we really have no desire for you just to simply come and sit in the seats and not be in relationship. It's in relationship is where lives are changed. Um, in, our small, in my small group that I'm in, we were talking about steps of faith. And, uh, and we, we were asking each other, what's the last time you just totally took a step out of faith? And so I talked about planning this church. I talked about, well, about 10 years ago, when I was about 27. Um, this church, New Song Church, Wanted me to come, and they wanted to plant a church on the west side of town. And, but I had to raise all my money for two years. There was, no, there was no money ready. There was no money set aside. And there was no people ready to go. There, there were people that were, like, excited and may come, but there was not a core group ready to go. And, um, and, and Michelle and I, uh, you know, we, we had one. Uh, Hannah was one. And we're just like, we're young. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's do it. What have we got to lose? And what I said to my small group literally was, um, Michelle and I were just young and stupid. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know what? I need to keep being young and stupid. I, 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 I need to keep living a life. Where I look back and I go, wow, that was crazy. But God moved. Stop using the excuses, people. Stop. Stop thinking someone's better than you. Stop thinking that God's got someone else to do it. Stop thinking that you're not good enough. Stop. Get on the journey, man. God is more. God can do immeasurably more than all you could ask or imagine. God can use you to do it. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for an old life where you grow old with your wife and you sit on a golf course 
at 80 and going, wow, what a nice day as we play golf. Really? I mean, seriously, if you get there and you're there, I guarantee you, you're going to be going, this really kind of stinks. You will. Go for the more. Trust God to do great things in your life. Don't settle for, let's let someone else do it. You do it. Step up and live it out in faith. Exodus 4, 14. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. God was furious. Because Moses was willing to settle for less. Because he thought that God should send someone else. You do it. Be the man. Be the woman that God has called you to be. Step out in faith. Do the crazy things. Can the worship team come up? Don't miss out on the God that is more. Don't miss out. Let me just share with this with you. And I know the worship team is going to come up and there may be some drag, but please, please listen to this story. Last week, last week, Hannah came home from school. Hannah is my 11-year-old daughter. Um, man, she, she is just an awesome follower of Jesus. And, um, but I could tell when she came home from school that she was discouraged. There's something in her spirit. Hannah's usually a pretty happy girl. And there's something in her spirit that was, she, I could just sense that she was discouraged. And, and, um, and I, I said to Hannah, I said, what, what's going on? What's up? What are you struggling with? What, what's happening? And, and, um, and, and she said, Daddy, she said, I, I, just, I just don't know how we're going to get to Africa. And I, I said, what? For you guys who don't know, my, my brother uh, is in Africa, and uh, they have four kids of their own, and, and my kids and their kids, and they're very, very close, and it's been really hard on my family to see them go, and yet we're so excited that they're there. But we've just been praying for every day, every night, Paige and Hannah especially, just pray that we'll be able to end up in Africa. And, and, and Hannah, Hannah wants so badly, and I want so badly just to go and honestly just hug my brother and my nieces and nephews, right? I mean, I, don't, I want to see the animals. That'd be really cool, but I just want to, I just want to be. So, so I said, I said, well, I said, God can do it. God can have us go. And Hannah, and Hannah was like, but I don't know how. Is he just going to put money out of the ceiling? I was like, wow, that's a good question. I mean, she was essentially asking, what good is God if he can't write a check? And then she said this to me. And then she said, Daddy, and I don't know how my friends at school are ever going to come and put their faith in Jesus. I want my friends to know Jesus. And when I talk to them, their parents won't let them come do our things. Their parents won't let them come to church. Their parents won't let them come to the things that we do. And she's so smart. She's like, and I don't blame them. Because if they asked me to go to their mosque, you wouldn't let me go. Daddy, how, how are my friends ever going to come to know Jesus? Our heart of this church is to build homes of faith. So let me just share with you what, what God laid on my heart to do, and I hope this encourages you as a family. Or if you're single, honestly, uh, do this with your friends. At dinner that night, Michelle and I, together, um, sat down with our family, and we just shared God's stories. We talked about the time that when we were in seminary, and we had no money, and we'd just find money in our mailbox talked about the time that there was a, there was a need that we had and, and we found $400 in Hannah's crib. We talked about the time that, that when we had no air conditioning in our new home in Bolingbrook and Michelle was pregnant, that we found $2,000 in our mailbox. We, we, we talked about how, how God has used 
how God has used me in people's lives and how people have come to put their faith in Jesus when I had no idea how they would ever do it. We just talked about all these stories about how God moved. And, and all of a sudden, I, heard, I just saw that, that all my kids and their eyes just begin to lift up and get excited and begin to go, wow, wow, God does those things? I mean, mean, mean God can just do that? And I said, yeah, that's what God does. But here's what I learned as a, as a dad. Here's what I learned. If I stop living for Jesus and just start teaching them about Jesus, do you get me on this? If, if I stop trusting God with all my life and keep taking the scary steps and living out in faith and taking the steps where we go, we're crazy to do this, and keep taking those steps and keep taking those steps, my kids are going to go, wow, I know a lot about God, but I don't see him anywhere. Don't settle for less. Grandma and grandpas, don't settle for less. Your grandkids are watching you. My kids are watching my grandpa and grandma. God is more. God, God has an adventure for you. That, that there is this life of faith and adventure. And you're going to look back and you go, wow, God is more. And your kids are going to go, God is more. Don't live in the excuses. You can do it. Because God, because God can do it. He's able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine. Think about that. That thing right now that's on your heart, that thing that you're going, there's no way. Yes, God is able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine. Let's pray. Lord God, I just pray, Lord, that we will be a church that lives all out for you, that we will not live in the excuses of let some other church do it. Let someone else do it. We're not good enough. We need to know more. God, just take over. Take over my life. Take over each person's life here. That we will live a life all out for you. God, wake us up to the power of your Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. Wake us up to how powerful you are in our lives. Wake us up. In Jesus' name, amen.